Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our webcast on culture and conduct. I'm Anna Young from the Chartered Banker Institute and I'm delighted to introduce Natalie Wharton, who's the CEO of Wharton Business Consulting. We are also joined by her colleague, Claire. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit these by, by the online function um, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. I will now hand over to Natalie. Thank you, Anna, and welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm a female entrepreneur and also founder of Wharton Business Consulting and really passionate about supporting our industry in financial services, create a real ethical, sound culture and conduct in what we do. Uh, just a little bit of a, a background on me and Wharton. So over the last 20 years, I've been helping businesses transform, looking at both their leadership, so both their leadership development, architecture, talent, so thinking about their talent strategies, how they organize themselves, so the overall organizational design, and most importantly, as we're here today, to talk about culture. How do we change culture, and how do we, we go about that? And Wharton Business Consulting, we are a small business that are very much focused on all of those elements and really passionate about supporting you all. So I'm going to share our presentation today and look forward to taking you through. As Anna said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will go through those together. So first off, first of all, if you can, we'd really appreciate it if you can go onto Slido. So those of you who haven't used Slido before, it's just www.slido.com. We want to make this as interactive as possible for this live webinar. So if you use the code 92637 when you're on there, I'll remind you that in a moment. But if you could do that now, either toggle onto another web browser and just add it on and you can then come back or you can use the app on your phone. Fabulous. So what I really want to do with you today over this 45 minute session is give you some time and space to really explore organizational culture. And I want to do that being very relevant of where we are today in the pandemic. So I will talk about how the additional pressures of COVID-19 have been put on our culture and our conduct. And then we'll get into a, a bit of theory and explain some of the key steps in defining and measuring and embedding the culture that you want to achieve and your overall conduct framework. And lastly, if we have time, we will examine some of the critical leadership behaviours and capability that you need for the future. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be using Slido in a minute. So just a reminder there of the code. And just whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to give you a, a bit of a bit of a snippet on what I've previously done. So, for example, I supported Barclays when they were launching their new values and behaviours when Anthony Jenkins became in the, the leader there. So very much around how to articulate those values and behaviours all the way through the organisation and how you embed those. And also we did a lot of the, the measurements in terms of what does that actually look like by individual and also the organisations. I also supported Lloyd's TSB and the HBOS merger and integration. So helping to think about the colleague journey and what all of the components and the holistic view on what the journey is that the colleagues of that organisation women go through. And finally, conduct risk. I set up the framework for ICBC Standard Bank from the beginning all the way through into actually embedding that into their control framework and also looking at measurement and governance there. So hopefully now we have you on Slido and I can go first into the questions that we have today. So. If we're ready, we'll go into our poll. So we wanted to ask you, in banking, people feel safe to speak up. Can you just ask, uh, answer that for me on your Slido, just how you feel that people are able to speak up within an organisation? And this is because we want to look into the ability of trust in and transparency in an organization. Okay, we've just got a, a couple of responses there. I'm assuming some of you are still working the technology 
So, okay, great. All right, that's really interesting. So I'll just pause on that for a moment just to give you a bit of a perspective. So Banking Standards Boards in their report in 2019, when they were asked, have you wanted to raise a concern for your organization over the last 12 months? A quarter of those who were surveyed and noting that there were 72,000 responses, a quarter said that yes, they would have wanted to raise a concern. Yet only 63% actually raised that concern and less than 50% felt they were being listened to. So there's really something there around what are the organization's ability to enable their people to speak up. But also with the research that we do with uh, John Higgins, our Astridge research partner, shows that actually senior leadership persistently overestimate how honestly people speak up to them. And board executives are almost the most wake generation as they're not so aware of their own biases. So I think it's really important to think about speak up because it's a core component of transparency in organizations. And I'll come to you later about some of the barriers um, to speaking up. I also would like to go to a, a key area for me, the question here, as you can see, is UK banks are moving towards a more balanced purpose of both profit and meaning. I'd love to hear from you whether you think this statement you would strongly agree, disagree, or any anything in between. I'll just give you a, a moment there to respond. Okay. So a couple of responses there. I think it's really important for us to think about our noble purpose to help the economy and society grow is often overshadowed by a financial scandal and perception that the sole purpose of the financial system is to make profit. I would also say though, with recent events, we have seen banks being witnessed as really coming to light and supporting our economy and some would say heroes of our economy as they're saviors to small businesses. I'm part of the Goldman Sachs Small Businesses Program and I really see that the banks are really trying to support those small businesses very quickly turning around the loans and really helping to think about how small businesses as well as, uh, as individuals are able to be supported. So thank you for your contributions there today. Okay. And the last poll for me that I would like to do is going back to this speak up, not just on the concerns as we see there, but as understanding people's ability to speak up on opportunities. So I think if we look at where we are today, again, it's thinking around there is a lot of opportunities for us to learn and for continuous learning in our in our economies, in our society and thinking around from a conduct perspective, are we open to learn? of new ways of doing things, new ways of ways of working. How are we going to learn from all of the great bright spots that we see happening around us? So it's great to see here, as you would expect, a much more positive response into those polls. So thank you there for those that contributed today. So going back to our presentation and the questions we've gone through. So I guess the first sort of provoke question I'm looking at here is whether whether the culture of banking has shifted to create a more ethically sound financial system or is misconduct still a significant issue? Well, I think we've seen there today and some of the polling there and some of the results that actually we are we still got some way to go. And if we look at last year, when the first half of 2019, the FCA imposed 10 fines worth 319 million pounds, which is more than five times the 2018 total, outstripping the combined total for the previous years. And you can see here some of the blockbuster fines that we saw happen in that year, as well as some of those that came to the fore um, as a result of previous years. So everything from the AML breaches that we've seen there, the cyber attacks, misreporting, along with ongoing PPI provisions, 
And I know that we have some people here today from Lloyds Bank and we have Santander and we also have, I believe, Wells Fargo that are joining us today. So I really appreciate those of you that have joined from those organizations. And as we go further down, it'd be great to hear some of the great work that has been done in, done in those organizations to move us forward too. So moving on to, okay, so not being here just about scaremongering and looking to scrutinize because there's actually a lot of good that has been going on in our economy and our, our organizations. 12 years ago, as a culture expert, very few organizations actually wanted me to come in and talk to them about culture. They still saw it as very conceptual. And now we're seeing there's a lot more of an emphasis. We have conduct risk directors, culture directors throughout our, um, our banking industry. So let's just break that down. How do we actually change culture and conduct? And let's also look at the pressure points on that from COVID-19. So first of all, I want us to think about culture and think about organizational culture. Now, it's often described as an organization's DNA. And we've seen that time and time again. And yes, it's a great way of describing that there are these beliefs underlying assumptions within an organization, almost like your, your print within an organization. But I'd like to take this a little bit further and think, actually, DNA, how do you change DNA? Genetic engineering, maybe. It's very hard to change DNA. And the secret here is about the link to conduct. So let's unpack DNA for a moment in the context of culture. So firstly, cells. So cells carry your DNA around your body. And if we think about those cells, they form into a collection of muscles and muscle tissue, along with many other things. But hey, we're not into a biology lesson for today. So actually thinking about those muscles, muscles power movement. But actually, that movement is not just from the cells and everything else that's packed into there, but actually, it's also played a part around our conscious and unconscious thought. And all of that together results in our everyday behavior. So if we think about that conduct is the day-to-day -day manifestation of culture, let's think about our muscles and our muscles' tissues as being that conduct. They are informed by our thoughts, conscious and unconscious, and they are formed by our cells that carry the DNA. And the reason we want to think about that for a moment and use this in where we're describing how to change culture and ultimately conduct is that culture does influence our conduct and behavior drives outcomes. And if we go to the thought of it being muscles, we can train, we can tone, we can exercise our muscle tissue, so therefore our conduct. Yes, it can fatigue and tire and, and waste away, but it also can be strengthened. And there are levers, there are ways to increase your muscle tone, to increase your muscle or your conduct. And that's what we are going to explore today. But first, before we do, let's just think about actually within this, we have pressure points. And there have been additional pressure points. And I'm just going to look at these seven additional pressure points that have come as a result of COVID. Management are overwhelmed. We saw in the first two to four weeks when I've been talking to you, many organisations, many banks like yourselves, that actually at the management level, they're very overwhelmed. They had targets, unachievable targets in many states, no change to their targets that they had previously been set. They were overwhelmed by the need to be very directive in a, a time when we had previously been very much encouraging to delegate and empower your teams. There was a need to be command and control and really bring direction, both at the leadership and the management level. And yet there was still those business and profit pressures. And we all know from a conduct perspective, when there are additional pressures around profit and business, that can lead to behavior and conduct, which we wouldn't normally see. 
Couple that onto the increase of visibility and the social need of leadership and management, we're seeing, if we come back to the muscle, that need for additional empathy, being on the end of a video conference, and being very social and interactive with your teams. We hear from organisations that have had daily catch ups where the execs have had a ask any question and you know they've very much previously been very scripted in those communications and now they're having to really really build that muscle of empathy and social need that they haven't had to do so much in the past increased external scrutiny we see the regulators asking the banks why were certain decisions being made and how they were managing operational resilience in that time changing needs of customers volatility of markets making rapid decisions with limited information, shared workspaces where people in call centers are now back in their flats where they may be sharing those spaces and increasing the possibility of risk. And as you can see there, more around fear and complexity of speak up, health concerns and lower resilience. And if you think of that in the context of speak up, we're seeing each other's social settings in a, a much broader sense. We're getting to know our peers and, and our colleagues in a, in a much more human way but that also raises our concern for their well-being and if we do spot something that normally we may just walk over to someone someone else's desk saying I saw this is this an issue now it has to be a much more formal escalation so will we really be raising those small elements of concerns and issues as widely so I think it's really important to think about all of those additional pressure points around conduct. And ultimately, our risks have changed. So the controls that we've put in place previously around conduct and behavior, are those still relevant? And how many organizations have really started to think about how those controls may change? So let's just take one example, supervision. We would partly look at supervision through physical observations walking the floor, sitting with your team, just observing behavior as we see, seeing that sense, that net nuance, and almost that, that untapped sort of energy around the organization gives you a lot of cues into what's going on. But we're only seeing body language from the shoulders up. And, and also we're only seeing it when we're actually engaging over those mediums of uh, virtual and also when we are physically in the office you almost have a lattice effect it's not just your supervision over your direct team but other management and other people and other teams are also inadvertently overlooking others and, and their teams and can spot where something might be going wrong so we need to rethink how we control that and what we do around that and i'd like to ask you to go back onto the slurdo for a moment I'd like to actually for us to think about for you, from what you've heard, which of these do you think are the most significant pressures impacting culture and conduct within your organizations at the present? So we we'll move on to that next question, if I may. So if you would mind responding, what do you see as the most significant pressure on the organization. You can select three, so feel free to start selecting ones that you feel are more important for your organization and send those answers three once you've selected three. And I'll continue to go through that. In the background, Claire will be gathering those results for me and we can look at those at the end in terms of how they have actually made changes and feel free in the questions as well in the questions section here if you would like to add any questions or any thoughts on actually other impacts and pressures that you're seeing in your organization so as we are just talking about pressures and conduct we've just talked quite a bit there now i'm just going to give you an opportunity to have just a two break, uh, two minute break take a screen break look away from the screen for a moment look outside, jot down a few notes, or grab the drink that may be next to you. And we're just gonna take that minute to sit back, think about what we just talked through before we move into actually our approach.
Okay, welcoming everyone back. So thank you for that. So we've just talked, so just to reflect on what we've covered today, we've already talked about to what extent trust and transparency are still significant issues within our industry. We've looked at how we unpack organizational DNA and how that links to conduct and thinking about it in terms of muscles and how we can train those muscles. And we've explored some of those seismic changes in conduct and the way that we behave and therefore how our businesses need to rethink around risk and control. So now we're going to move on to a bit of explaining what we can do in those areas. So what are the critical steps that are required to reinforce an organization's culture and manage conduct? So I'd like to take for a moment just to use an approach that I've used over the last 15 years in our, um, our approach to culture and conduct. I mentioned quite a few banks that we've supported, not just thinking about the culture, but often the conduct risk framework here. So there are three core areas that you need to do and many of these you may already be working on or have been doing for some time we know that culture and, and conduct has been a, a topic of conversation in our industry for a long time but I think it's really important to actually sit back reflect what are we learning from this what do we do differently and how do we blend art and science with a laser focus on behavior to really accelerate our culture? As we know, culture can be a great competitive advantage for us and actually really bring a collective viewpoint across our organization and help really maximize our performance. So we try to keep things simple because that's what's key with culture here. So you have three areas, framework definition and prioritization, measurement and governance, and then finally, um, engagement and education. So if we look at what are the seven core underpinning components of that, a real critical success factors that we want you to think about, and we'll put those through in a bit more detail as we dive into each of these three areas. First, North Star. So important as we look at this around what's what are we trying to achieve? What's the outcome we're trying to achieve? And what's our real cultural difference or our cultural challenge that we're focusing on? Secondly, critical behavioral focus. You cannot sheep dip culture, values and conduct. You need to focus on what's going to make a disproportionate impact on your business. What's that critical behavior? Could be one or two and just Focus on those, make, make the changes, make the nudges and the shift around those, experiment and really see a difference happening. Use hypotheses-led work to help you actually accelerate through measurement into intervention. So we use a lot of architecture around hypotheses, using narrative and thematics to, to really draw it through and to bring it to attention. And enterprise-wide directional metrics. I'll explain that in a bit more detail later, but it's really thinking about this is cross your organization. And I'll, I'll really share my passion around that in a moment about how important it is to be enterprise-wide in this, both in your metrics, but your framework. And it's really about art and science. Art and science system thinking. As you saw a moment ago with those pressure points, everything is interrelated. And often when we look at operational resilience, we've been looking at it from a process and technology perspective. We need to look at it from a people perspective. As we've seen with the current pandemic, the importance of our people and, the, and how everything is centered around that right now. And rapid experimentation. It's about continuous learning. It's about being agile, trying something, making sure that that's achieving your outcome and your objective. And if it's not, go to the next thing. We all know about working agilely and failing fast. This is so important with culture as well. It takes a long time to shift culture. If you think back to the DNA, to the muscles, to the muscle turn, it takes time. You can't just go on a retreat and expect that that muscle tone will stay with you. It won't. You need to work at it. You need to build it. You need to reinforce it, not just in exercise, but in your overall health and your nutrition and your discipline, as well as behavioral triggers. And we'll look at those triggers in a bit more detail. So first of all, let's look at the integrated framework. 
Culture, conduct and accountability is intrinsically linked. And yet we see culture frameworks very, very much led by HR and conduct risk, reputational risk, frameworks around that often led by risk functions, sometimes also uh, led by compliance and sometimes HR. And also when we have your senior manager regime that's led by uh, compliance and again across the piece, but they're often led in isolation of each other, but they're so, so linked. So if you look at culture, which is very much led by your purpose and making sure your purpose is led down to your culture, then into conduct. So as we said, conduct is your day-to-day behavior. It's how that culture is manifested and what you do, your actions, your intentional conduct and your unintentional conduct. And I think that's really, really important because a lot of, as you saw in those press releases, a lot of that wasn't intentional misconduct or market conduct, much around misreporting um, and other areas of conduct is actually done unintentionally. And it's important that people really get to grips with that and that we're clear on our risk appetite. And as we've shown there today, I've been talking to many board members and execs around what they're doing in this crisis. We see many actually think about their purpose and actually looking at how do we reshape that and redefine that for now. We see a lot of organisations also then tackling is our risk appetite changing and how is that changing? And all of those will impact what we do on our culture and conduct. And accountability sits for me very much in that conduct space. So I'm going to take you through a framework. It's a framework around culture that I've been using a good 12 years now, continually develop it around the edges, but very much it, it works in a logical fashion that you will have your vision You'll have your vision statement and you'll break that down into values. And each one of those values needs a clear behavioural statement underneath it. We've helped many organisations across banking. I can name the top five that I have helped think about this and think about their framework and continually evolve it. So let me use an example. Okay, so if an organisation has purpose and vision around enabling people to achieve ambition through banking through one bank, through cross-firm solutions and global reach. So if that's their vision, their values may break down to respect, integrity, excellent service. And to be honest, we've surveyed many organisations and there are the same values that will come up time and time again. That's what our external customers are looking for in an organisation to give us that comfort and trust that the organization and those banks are really focused on the right things. But what it comes down to is not just putting your values on your wall or in your reception areas, it's how you articulate that in the behaviors. And let's think for a moment that a behavior under excellence as a value may be around collaborative cross-firm working, flawless execution, learning from the mistakes and pride in all we do. So there's a couple of behaviors that they have there. But the important thing is it's not just stop there. You think about the behaviours across your leadership, your managers and all others, and you actually build critical moments and help them understand, bring that to life. And we'll look at that in a moment when we go through what it looks like in interventions. And then when we take those vision, values and behaviours, we then break them down and think about it across your conduct risk framework. So again, this is a framework I've worked with, gosh, about 10 banks and investment banks across the industry and also insurers when I've looked at their conduct risk framework. And there are key elements here. It's important a lot of organizations forget to look at conduct around strategy. So are we executing our strategy in our organization Is it sustainable and does it ensure fair outcomes for our clients and our industries? So really thinking about the strategy. And we haven't got time to go through all conduct risks there, but if that's the outcome, it's important to think about what are the risks behind that. Then as you go down there, you're thinking about organisation and governance. Again, such a critical point in a conduct risk framework is thinking about how is your organization structured? What's the governance? What's the speed of escalation? What are those channels that we see before us? When we talked about earlier around speak up, the research that us at Walton BC and 
partnered with our Astrid researcher, John Higgins, we look at four key areas of why people don't speak up. Yes, there's fear, fear of repercussions, fear of reputation, fear of respect of others. Secondly, it's around futility. A lot of organisations don't actually share transparently what they do with that information when something is escalated, big or small, be it a concern a and an idea. And, and we saw that in that banking standards report as well, is that actually you have 63% of those that raised the concern, less than 50% felt they were listened to. So the importance of having that clear framework around escalation and speaking up. And really the two other areas that we have there is navigation, having a channel and having a safe environment. And, and really around that is about listening as well and blind spots. And again, we can talk about that at length at another time for you. Going down infrastructure. So this looks at everything around your infrastructure from record keeping, system resilience, and but the important thing here is thinking about the conduct around that. How are you protecting client and price sensitive information? How are you ensuring around cyber security that you've got the right behaviors in your organization? I think it's really important for us to think about now, what, what are the behaviors that we want to instill in an organization around working more digitally. We've rushed to get us all working remotely for many organizations. That's a huge catapult into the future for them. But what are we doing about setting expectations around working remotely and what we want in the future? So I can talk about length on those, but I really want to get us through to the, to the next area. So to summarize the key areas, it's about articulating your framework and thinking about it in a really combined way, corporate system thinking here, linking culture, conduct and accountability across your organization, your operational business and your customer perspective. Prioritization. When we were working in one bank, we had 200 conduct risks that we started out with. We then pulled that down to 60 really strong conduct risks that we wanted to focus on. And as we went through measurement, we had a top 14 that we were measuring on a regular basis. And it's important that you really prioritize those that coming back to the point around laser focus. So really thinking about what are those behaviors going to make a difference? And the behavior at the top there in your framework, take collaboration, it needs to filter all the way down into how do you collaborate across your structures? How do you collaborate in your infrastructure? Is that enabled? If collaboration is going to be your differentiator and enable you you as a business to work cross firm how is that being enabled through your whole conduct risk framework then and finally it's really thinking about hypothesizing so if I may for a moment just think about an hypothesis for you for the example that I used so if people have a propensity to self-solve rather than seek advice if we want to increase a customer service and build holistic solutions for our clients, we need to create an environment that shifts from individual to collective action and direction. So that would be, for me, a strong hypothesis that you take out of this stage and into our next, which is measurement. And I would ask if there are any questions coming through here. I know Claire from my team is in the background. So feel free to ask any questions around the framework and I'll come back to them for you. So next, looking on to measurement. Measurement is key. But I think what I what I continue to observe across organisations is back to my earlier point that there's a culture dashboard. There is a conduct risk dashboard. There may be a behavioral dashboard and there's a senior uh, manager regime dashboard. There's often dashboards everywhere, but also dashboards continue to focus on tangible numerical lagging metrics. Firms often don't put together what is accessible and what they understand. So that's what they focus on. I've got these metrics. I've got a great engagement scores and number of training days. That's what I have. In, in, in access, I'm going to retrofit those to some statements that I want to build. So it's focused on what is already reported and not linking to conduct, effectively blindsiding your exec team and your boards. When an emotion is translated into a numerical value, 
it loses its true meaning. So it's really important here when we think about blending art and science. You do need the science, but you need the behavioral science and thinking it through, not just at the, at the metrics that you have to the fore, and thinking around how else do you get the data points, qualitative and quantitative. So our approach around blending art and science, we leverage social, neuro and applied science and overlay that with human intelligence to drive meaning from the data and to create true insight. So it's important to think about that. I have observed an inadvertently silenced of silencing of the employee voice once it gets to the dashboard and to the exec level. Many execs that I've been in, we need to bring to life those real stories about what people are saying and what's happening. And that's where the blending of art and science comes in. And that's where we use critical moments, iconic moments, and, and we'll come to those in a minute that really bring them to life. But you can see here, we don't need to go through every step uh, conscious of time, but you can see here, it's really about focusing on that cultural challenge. So we talked about that hypothesis there that would bring in, narrowing the scope, by really thinking about the key behaviors that have that disproportionate impact and building on strengths, the importance to amplify your strengths as well. But again, think back to the, to the thought around a retreat. It doesn't solve all your problems, just focusing on one time and doing one set of metrics. You know, if you measure your fitness at the end of that retreat, of course, it's going to be greater. But how quickly do those muscles tire fatigue if you don't continually work them? So you need to focus on that one area that you want that's going to make a difference, that behavior, and focus it through. Hypothesis we've talked about, but really thinking about the cultural traits and test through enterprise-wide metrics. So what we mean there is people and organization, but also operational, business, and customer metrics. Thinking through in a systems way, not just leading and lagging, but qual and quant as well and use rapid experimentation to assess and validate what's influencing and driving behavior. You don't want to be stuck with huge dashboards that don't really tell you anything and you're spending all your time really going over the same metrics. Quickly zero in, laser focus into that behavior, understand it, find the directional metrics. So something that truly changes and, and is a true uh, value onto that actual area of behavior you want to train. So you hear a lot around engagement surveys, but think about to what extent do we have cross business unit products? If we think about the collaboration area, how many decisions are being made outside of governance meetings or overturned? What are we really hearing from our people? Are they speaking up? What engagement have we got across and how are we rewarding and recognizing people? And obviously that was all underpinned by your governance model and framework. But let me take you into actually thinking through more about what we do and how we change this. So it all comes down to seven core levers. These levers are ones that we've worked with over the last 15, 20 years. And notice there, I'd like to, I'm sure, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but systems and processes. So everyone talks about controls, but control sits in systems and processes. That's one lever out of seven. And we know that leadership actually accounts for 70% of the driver of organizational culture and conduct. So if leadership is 70%, there's six other levers. One could guess at five to 10% of actually influencing culture and conduct comes from controls. So it's important to think about everything else. Often when I go in an organization, I will ask them, which of these levers are you using for what you're trying to achieve? We'll see maybe reward is being pulled to some extent, or the lever of leadership is being pulled. But very rarely are they thinking across the whole landscape of all of those areas. And I'm going to give you a little example in each. So if we think about leadership at all levels, it's about visibility. So we know now, as we've mentioned before, is that that 
empathy muscle, that social engagement muscle of leadership is now more important than ever. We hear about how connected our leaders are, how great it is that we can ask them any questions, that visibility, we've really seen the impact that that can make in times of crisis. But role modelling is super important as well. I think back to many examples in banking where leaders have been unaware of the shadow they've cast. Whether, for example, I heard that a CFO shouted down an employee's question in a town hall, leaving a ripple of fear in the organisation of, of what they've raised. Or the MD who opened up a breakfast saying, I don't expect any of you to understand or relate to the world I live in. Unintentionally, he had actually taken and created a huge power difference in that room. And made people fearful to speak up because of that that difference and and status that had been created. But all he was trying to do was actually empathise and trying to get at the level with their attendees. So it's really important that these iconic moments are seen as a living legacy and a snapshot of our corporate culture. Let me take some examples in the, the current pandemic, for example. When I was speaking to Santander the other day, it was great to hear and and many other banks have followed about how their senior leaders, starting with the exec chairman and CEO, had actually sacrificed part of their salaries to put it into a fund to help their society, whether that be funds for the universities for research or indeed for protective clothing. We see other organisations doing the same, where senior execs in their organisation are sacrificing bonuses to help and to ensure that they don't have to lay off their people in this time of crisis. How that in itself creates such motivation, but also reassurance for those in your workforce that there's one less thing that they need to worry about. So moving on to organisation and governance, I appreciate some of this text is small, but there we talk about strategy and performance and organisational structure. I think it's really also important. Many people talk about there being a flat structure. My research partner from Astridge would often say there isn't such a thing as a as a flat structure. There's always hierarchy because of power difference. And even if we take titles away, we still look to the parent child in our organisation. And in times like these, we see the importance for leaders to lead and give direction. That's what organisations are looking for. Yet the importance of decision making, as I mentioned before, if decisions are made outside of the actual forum and and how those decision makings take place, if it's a consensus base versus taking one's opinion. Reward and recognition, again, such an important element in our pursuit to really shape and tone our culture. So how are we rewarding people? What is our balanced scorecard? And how does performance look across this? I, I think back again to, to now I'm asking organizations, what are they doing? How are they how are their reward structures and performance management going to reward the prolonged need for people to dial up empathy and their engagement? Many organisations don't have those factors in their performance management frameworks. Some organisations, yes, they some of the banks I've been talking to, they've taken away structured performance, but others still have very much. Yes, we've got the the what and the how, but the who, if you're trying to reward people on a collective basis, the who is still very individually led. But also in this time of crisis, how will promotions, recognition, reward continue past the immediacy that we see today? And recruitment and development. This is again key because we need to think about how do we capitalise on the right behaviours that we see across our organisation. So if I think about how we recruit, we often recruit a reflection of ourselves. It's what we understand, it's what we know. And we look to bring in new perspectives and skills, which we will need as we go forward in our new norm. How do we do that when we don't know how to assess it? So we need to think differently about how we recruit. One organisation that we spoke to started and they had not had a new hire in their exec who had lasted more than 12 months in the last 20 years. So thinking about 
taking away that mirror and how else you can really recruit people in. And also, I think, to where we are today, if you think many organisations are redeploying staff from underutilised areas to overutilise, we don't have time to train them and develop them in that business. And that business may have its own subculture, may have its own conduct and way of doing things. And how then do we ensure that we are staying culturally congruent to our organisation and our purpose? So as I start to come through the last couple, they're ones that you probably recognise a lot more. So engagement and communications and messaging, social connections, how do we build across symbols and stories? We've touched on a couple, but they really are the legacy that goes through your organisation and thinking about tone and language as you go through this. But engagement and communication and messaging are so key. We've talked about systems and process. Yes, they are critical, but focusing on the critical ones. And then finally, when we look about external environment, regulatory change, climate change, brand and perception are so important. The way that our customers, our stakeholders and our shareholders see us, how we are seen in the press, how we interact with our own social network and how they feel when we tell them who we work for and what that then brings on ourselves. All of these are huge uh, influences on our culture. So just as we, we finalise this area here, it's about quick experimenting, focusing back, thinking about the last two stages, that you're really focusing on one or two behaviours and looking at which levers make a real difference, experimenting on those and then really intervening where you are seeing a real size change in behaviours and learning and continuing to adapt. So rapid implementation and execution, but keeping it holistic and yet some simplistic. I often go in organisations and there's a myriad of cultural interventions. They're like, Natalie, I don't need your help. Look, I've got all of this. I was like, but how, how, what are they measuring? How are you ensuring that they're linked? How do they build on your core behaviour that's going to accelerate your business? Well, they don't. They're just great ideas that are being done. And yes, some of them are good, but some need to be deprioritised and we need to focus on those that are going to make a real difference. So I pause there. I'm just looking to Claire if there are any questions that are coming in at that stage. No, no questions at this stage. Thank you, Claire. So I've taken my 45 minutes. Um, I'm not going to go through critical leadership and capabilities to any great extent, but I just wanted to touch on the framework that we use. We initially brought this in as a fourth industrial revolution where we needed leaders to really focus on those personas that were so important for organizations and again you can go on our website and we have this information at length but never now has there been a greater point of when these are really coming to the fore back when we were speaking to organizations and really getting them to think how are you building a humble and inclusive leadership team who are curious and connected with their people, focused on their purpose and customers, yet reinventing and dis dis disrupting the organisations. This now is, is never more important, as we've talked about, and that muscle around humble inclusivity is so important, being purposeful, making sense for people of what's going on, bringing quick decisions. So yes, there's the situational leadership that really wraps around this, but it's so important that your leaders have those core personas behind them that really drives the right behaviors. And as we said, that needs to stick as we go through. Um, Natalie, we've just had a really great question come through asking how we can help to retain talent in such uncertain times. That's a really good question. And we've been helping organisations think about that. And I think you really need to go back to actually what it is that you're trying to, to promote in terms of your purpose and how you're engaging people. And happy to take that one offline and answer it in a separate forum as we've run out of time to go through that in length. But yes, retaining talent is very important. There are, may I just add to that, that there are four 
core triggers right now that are influencing people from a behavior and psychology perspective. So we do a lot of training at the moment to businesses, helping them to think about the management level around how they can really understand the journey people are going on. And that is a real key one for us. So if you think about that for talent, understanding people and understanding the situation that they're going through and understanding those triggers right now is super important. So thinking about the trigger from a personal perspective and really understanding what's happening for them and how that will change. And almost if you think about the change journey, although it was, was back in 1969 that Kubler-Ross came up with that, there's been lots of versions since around overlaying emotion and thinking about that in terms of this time of crisis and pandemic. So think about those triggers. And then in terms of retaining talent, I also say one of the things for me is if your talent wants to go, it's understanding why they want to go. But the true strength is if that talent wants to come back. So I think it's important that we don't hold our claws into talent and that we think about you know, understanding what their needs are, what their career tra trajectory is. Often people come into organizations and they don't expect to stay for their whole duration. So it's not just about retaining talent. It's engaging and motivating. But at the times that it's right for them to leave, it's it's letting them know that they can come back. Um, I see there's another questions come through as well. Yeah, there's so. a few great questions on, on culture. Um, do you think the impact COVID-19 has on culture will last when we get back to normal was the first one to come through? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because actually some of the changes in our culture will actually have a lasting impact. This is a prolonged crisis. If we think about what happens in a very standalone single event crisis that we see in organisations, whether that's, you know, um, something that's we've had to report to the FCA and we've, or a system failure, that is a one time fix that you want to actually try and reinforce a behavior around that. This is prolonged. So this is trying, this is already starting to change habits, starting to change perceptions, starting to change what people want in terms of, you know, their, the way that they work. So we need to think about the risk. Coming back to the point that I said around, and if you think about the two visuals or the two circles, around how conduct and our behavior is very much thought through through the lens of our risk appetite now our risk appetite has changed people are making decisions daily execs are having to evolve their their organizations daily this will have a lasting impact on our culture but ultimately it's thinking about what is it that we want to sustain out of this and it's important organizations think that through in in or in these times. So we're running labs with organizations to go, let's just do a two hours and look back. What are your bright spots? What's really worked? And actually it's about often amplifying those strengths of things that have worked and tagging that back to what are you trying to achieve going forward? Um, another question I see coming through as well, Claire. Yeah, there's some, um, well, the, the two you could probably look at them together because it's all about how kind of, how can we impact culture and where the responsibility lies. So the first one is, um, where does responsibility most lie? Uh, would it be top level or is everyone responsible for a good working culture? And then within that, how can you impact, uh, in, impact culture in a junior position in a company? Yeah, definitely. So let me take that first question. They're linked, but they're very separate answers. So the first one around responsibilities. I, I think there's a lot that is um, being put pressure on CEOs and leadership to be the ones. Yes, the board. It's the board's responsibility to help articulate what is the culture that we want and the exec and the CEO to help drive that through the organization and take accountability for. But it's everyone in the organization's responsibility on their own conduct and how they also engender the right culture and conduct within their organization. We've all got a role to play in this. And I think it's important as you know, we haven't been able to go into detail around conduct risks. And I'd be delighted to if any of you would like to contact, I'll, I'll have that on 
the last slide, as you can see, how you can contact me of any questions on those. But yes, if there are um, the thoughts around, actually, it needs to be through our organisation and it needs to be through those levers that we truly start to change culture and not just expect it to come from the leadership, albeit the leadership has a, a huge role to play. Um, I'll take that second question as well to that, which is how can you impact culture in a junior position in a company? So I think there's um, there's obviously a lot of research that's gone into millennials and Generation Zs. They are looking for something quite different. I was I was brought into a, not a bank but a, another organisation who were saying that a lot of the way they'd made judgments previously in the the leadership team, a lot had to be on on judgment and not data. But they were looking at their junior guys were very much being very much yes, but there's no data to support that. And how do you marry the two? It's important that actually leadership listen to juniors and what they are looking for. We can again share at another stage the data we did a research across 500 people in in tech companies around actually what is it that graduates are looking for in organizations they are looking for organizations to be transparent they're looking for organizations as we all know to have a really clear purpose and profit with meaning purpose so i think it's important to think about what they're looking for but also how you can impact culture in a junior position is very much around thinking not just raising the ideas making sure your voice is heard and if yours isn't heard it's raising that you know those channels aren't in place any other questions coming through on the chat there claire no other questions so i know we sped through this and and we've come up to the end of time and i promised you a couple of minutes back but to summarise, you've heard a bit about how we can really think around how we can tone, train and also shape our conduct. We've talked about, obviously, it is a continual focus for the FCA. I was brought into the FCA for two of their culture sprints. One was looking at how we empower middle management and also around cultural assessment. And it's clear that there is a continued focus and there is great intent and an appetite for positive change with our organizations. We are moving this industry forward, but it's very much for all of us to do, do that and really consider that broader purpose and not look at culture as just our values on our walls. We're seeing that now at those iconic moments. People are going to remember how their CEO and their line manager interacted during this time. It's not just what the CEO does and how they open lines of communication. It's the managers, it's the peers, it's the whole organization. And think about those coming into your organization now. How do they really feel the cultural nuances when they're not physically in the office? How do we support them as well? So we are transforming, we are moving forward in the right direction, but it's important that all of us help to sustain and, and create a resilient, ethical financial system for the new challenges ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. As we said, we've got our emails and contact details there. And if there's no more questions, I will stop sharing and bring back to our group thank you very much thank you very much everyone we will close it there